Hey, welcome back to another episode of the Entrepreneurial Family Man Podcast. I am Chris Niemeyer, here with my good friends, Jamie Slingerland, Michael McGreevy, and Christopher McCluskey. And as you know, we are just four guys who are crazy about our wives, we love our kids, and we want to kill it in business. And uh, this podcast is that safe area to deal with those, those challenging topics, areas of our life that, uh, that, that intersect. And let's be frank and really kind of the reason why we're even doing this live today for the first time is there's so much going on in our world around us right now. Uh, the, the news cycle, the current events of all of this coronavirus is so quickly changing and unfolding. We just thought this would be a, a great opportunity to, to go live and just share with you what's on our mind today because this is Monday, March 23rd. And, uh, and who knows where we'll be when you hear this, but I think the message we want to share, the topic we're going to talk about today will be relevant to whatever challenging situation you might be facing. Um, so today, as we talk about just the context, especially of the current events that we're in, we go back to a question that all of us were introduced to by our good friend, Dan Miller, uh, a year or two ago. And that is in, in any kind of situation, asking what does this make possible right now there's a lot of of fear Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty a lot of unknowns a lot of people losing their jobs being laid off whatever Uh, but what does this make possible in these situations we want to approach that today but michael i want to start with you we've talked a lot about fear before and uh you know you've had a saying about fear that that fear lives in ambiguity Uh, can you talk more about that well, fear is a healthy thing. It was built into us as humans for our own survival. We need that response to help protect ourselves. The only issue with that is after that initial response of fear, we can get stuck in that part of our brain where we are controlled by fear. And one thing that happens when we're controlled by fear is that part of our brain that can think creatively and can help us find solutions, that tends to be shut down when we're overcome by fear. Now, I've personally struggled with anxiety and fear for a, a large part of my life, my early adulthood. So I know what it feels like to be controlled by fear. It is not a great place to be when, it, when you need solutions, when you do, need to be thinking critically about how to respond and what to do. And that's where that ambiguity comes in. It's confusing. When you're just living in that fear, it just feels like there's no way out and there's nothing you can do and you're stuck and there's nothing that can be done about it. We need to learn how to step out of that part of our brain and into the part of our brain where we can start to formulate interesting ideas and, um, and solutions and ways of, of attacking this problem. That's where that clarity comes in. When we have clear ways of moving forward, the fear tends to melt away a little bit and we just know what we have to get done. Now I'm going to default to our resident expert on the brain, Mr. Christopher McCluskey. This is the, a concept that I learned from you. So Chris, can you talk a little bit more about that and how that works? Well, you bet with the qualifier that I'm only the resident expert, which means among us four <laughs> knuckleheads, I'm the guy who maybe knows a little more than the others. I'm Sorry no neuroscientist. <laughs> But yeah, of course, we're, we're talking about the part of the brain that we have identified here before that does assess danger, and it's called the amygdala. And that big fancy word is actually a pretty easy one to learn. It's kind of fun to say, and you'll impress a lot of people if you just say, oh, wait a minute, that sounds like amygdala thinking there. The amygdala is a more primitive inner part of our brain that is designed by God to preserve us. Thank the Lord that he created us with that and all input that we get first from our environment, including thoughts that are either spoken to us or that we have ourselves or any kind of a sensory stimuli. It goes first through the amygdala to just assess, is there danger here? That's what it's built for. And if there's danger, most important thing of everything else in the program, the software God gave us is to take kind of uh, reactive measures to preserve life. So run from the bear pull your hand out of the fire. You know, those kinds of don't trust this guy. Those kinds of quick assessments that we get come from that inner core called the amygdala. And we're very, very glad that we have it. It's not a complex reasoner. 
And that's what we need in the face of big long-term challenges like what we're facing now is complex reasoning. Well, that only happens in the majority of our brain, thankfully. The upper part that's just called the neocortex. That's kind of everything that you think of. We have the prefrontal cortex, but just the neocortex is everything. So left brain and the right brain talking to each other, our more emotional creative side, along with our more analytical thinking side, we can, we can assess situations from multiple uh, perspectives and neo meaning new, we can come up with new ideas, creative ways of addressing. So you want to, when any situation challenges you, recognize that first it's going to go in the, in the amygdala and you're going to do one of four basic reactions, fight, flee, freeze, which is not usually very helpful, like a deer in the headlights, or appease, which is kind of go through the motions of trying to make something not be quite so bad, or maybe just distract yourself for a while. If we don't think about it, maybe it'll go away. That's what a lot of folks do in the freeze, appease kind of a thing. But the problem if we stay there is we start to be like our computers when they're loading, 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 but never actually engaging an action, a program. We need to kick out of the amygdala once we've figured out whether or not there's serious danger and how to react. We need to kick up into the neocortex so we can proact. We can strategize and plan and team build and blue sky. Brainstorming together, we can come up with all kinds of possible solutions that the amygdala is never going to be able to come up with. Yeah, that's good. I know a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about practical steps that we could do. And me and Ruthie, we had a budget meeting. It's been years that we did that. But when I first started having a budget, I hated talking about anything negative because I was in that spot, McCluskey, and about just freezing. Like I'm a, I'm a po positive person. I'm an optimistic person. And so I didn't want to focus on anything that was defense. I wanted to focus on offense. But what I noticed is that when we asked ourselves really good questions in those budget meetings, actually talk about the fear and point it out. Like what happens if, if this happens, we make less money this month. That ambiguity when it went away by focusing on the negative through a proactive way of asking better questions. I mean, it was so, so surprising to me on how I just felt a deep level of peace of just saying, okay, if something bad happens, at least we can tap into this amount. It's not about ignoring the elephant in the room or, or, or anything like that, but that's what I used to think. And now um, I've learned that just with the family budget that me and Ruthie do. Yeah, that's solid in terms of being able to flip out of that, that amygdala that can so easily entangle us, right? And, and get up into that more creative new space. So not looking at that family budget meeting as an example, Jamie, of being one that like, oh man, I'm dreading this or this is, but saying, okay, like what, what's this going to make possible and what could we cut back on right now? A lot of people are asking that kind of question, right? There's a lot of anxiety out there. And, uh, you know, in, in, in this podcast, you probably hear us talk through the lens of faith uh, often. And so this is one where I just want to like, again, give that preface just like McCluskey did earlier, but like of the four of us, I'm definitely not the resident pastor or the resident uh, philosopher here. But you know, two, two weeks ago when, when all this was starting to happen and, and I own a travel company. So I was kind of more aware of how bad some of this was going to be. Uh, you know, our church announced that it was going to be online only. And uh, so I said, you know, I just felt a stirring because of everything that was going on that week, that particular weekend, I, I wanted to, to step up. I'm not, I'm not great at leading family devotions regularly, but I want to step up in a different way for my family because they knew some stuff was going on. And of course the news is around us. And I recall a particular pastor, uh, John Corson, that I've, that I've followed for years. He was our pastor in Oregon. And he had a great sermon about uh, the peace offering. And this is, this is crazy, right? This is like a Leviticus chapter three, Old Testament, sounds boring. You know, you're talking about like all these laws. But I, I listened to it again. And then I just started doing a lot more research and digging in and digging in. Here's what's interesting and how it relates to the amygdala actually is in Leviticus 3, in fact, Leviticus 3, chapter 4, when he talks about the peace offering that the Jews are supposed to give back in that time, he said, bring to me of, of the, the cattle, right, uh, of that offering, the kidneys, the liver, and this little piece called the call that was just above the liver. It was about the size of a thumb or an, an almond. Now, this is thousands of years ago. There's no science to know what that exactly was. But if you think about from our body's perspective, the liver, the kidney, that's the stuff, those are the glands, the organs that 
kind of catches all the stuff that we put into our bodies externally, all the toxins, all the, the stuff of outside this world that is not good for us. In that, in that chapter, God says, put this on the altar. I will burn it up and it will be a sweet incense of aroma to me. And then you will have peace. Well, what's that little call, that little fatty, weird tissue? That's actually related to and connected to your adrenal gland. And so all this stuff that when the amygdala is firing and this anxiety is happening and there's a bunch of words I can't even pronounce, but like cortisol and, and adrenal and uh, cortisone and all this stuff that's going on, that is our own internal toxins, our own stinking thinking that he gives a process in our own body to push that to this little tiny organ that sits right above the liver and the kidney. He says, burn that up. And there's actually, if you dig deeper here, there's actually now medical research that's done that says if, if that particular gland causes too much, there's too much of those particular types of uh, chemicals, you can have like, adrenal fatigue and, and all this other stuff that's horrible for the body. So I just love that, that in thousands of years ago, God gave this example to say, cast your cares on me. And literally in that time, cast this on the altar. I will take away your anxiety, your fear, all this stuff that's haunting you. If you do that, I will give you then peace. And so that was just a, it, interesting. We, we, we went through a lot of like just the connection to then like the New Testament, and how the peace that passes all understanding is only through this relationship we have with, with our Savior. And just a beautiful, you know, metaphor, I guess, of what's, what we're all going through right now. There's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, but this is a great place to start a conversation knowing that in the amygdala, we cannot live if we want to thrive. And so right now, as we're saying, what does this make possible? That's usually not an amygdala question. That's you've got to kick up from that, just like you did, Jamie. I want to move to like some practical questions. So people are going through stuff right now. What are some better questions we could be asking ourselves? What are some better ways we could be leading our families? Michael, as, as I see you and leading your family and your little kiddos, like what are you doing to, to ask better questions? Or what's the question you would ask to pose to, to those listening? Yeah, I think it, in stepping out of this fear, so we have to ask some questions about um, that it will take us to a place where we can make the most of this. And so when I think about my own life, I'm thinking that, that very question right there of how can we make the most of this? We are all together and we're not, we don't have any excuses. None of us are, have to go somewhere, have to be somewhere else, have too much work to do, too much of this, too much of that. So I'm thinking, how as a family can we make the most of this? And I'm a seven, so I'm, I'm immediately leaning toward how can we have the most fun possible. And I think I'm going to do this tonight. I've done it before, but I'm going to have a surprise food fight during dinner time with all my little kids. I have five and younger kids. So, you know, them eating a regular meal is like a food fight in and of itself. It's like, you know, spaghetti and sauce and whatever else all over their faces every single night. So they're going to lose it. But if I'm th worried about, oh, are we going to have enough food? Am I going to have enough income? Is everything going to be okay? Are we all going to die of starvation? If that's what I'm thinking, I am missing an opportunity to have joy and abundance with my family in this season that I'm in right now. So that's wow. what I'm thinking about right now is how can we make the most of it? I even talked to Lydia earlier about putting in a climbing wall in her upstairs. <laughs> I mean, actually drilling in footholds and handholds that we can crawl all the way up to the peak of our cathedral ceiling upstairs. I'm even thinking of putting it. a little belay pulley up there as well. And <laughs> why not learn how to mountain climb while we're yeah. stuck in the house here? So yeah. I love that question. Dan Miller um, is responsible for sharing that with, with me of what does this make possible? Come up with your own version of what that means in your own house and go with it. Start asking those questions. What could be rather than what's going to happen to me? I love that. Yeah. When I focus on, on fear and what I need and what my family needs, um, I just don't get the right answers to those questions. So I'm asking myself, how can the Slingerlands be a blessing to other people? Because 
at the end of the day, we do spend most of our energy focusing on ourselves and what we need, but um, it puts us into a posture where um, a little bit lighter. What, Neymar, what do you say? A pep in your step, a pop in your hop? Pop That's in your right. hop. Pop in your <laughs> hop. But I mean, as we focus on um, just serving others and doing the best we can with the current situation, it feels good. So um, we were driving, Ruthie and I went to Home Depot the other day, and we saw neighbors in the driving down the street and we asked a couple of people, Hey, we're headed to home Depot. Like, does anybody need anything? And so we picked up a bolt. It cost like a dollar 50 for our neighbor. It wasn't a big deal, but it just made our day better by asking ourselves, what do other people need? We're going places and doing things to get essential items. And what if we look around and say, how can we be a blessing to each other? And then, you know, that generosity will spread throughout our neighborhoods and our communities and we can all do better together instead of, instead of just being fearful about talking to people. You reframed, right? Not, not what could we do for ourselves, but how could we be a blessing to others yeah. in like your neighborhood? A, like, it's that's like a, a John great... F. Kennedy quote. Maybe McGreevy said it. Like, ask not what you what can you do for can your do country. For your Isn't country? that McGreevy ask said me. that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining you handing this bolt in a cup full of rubbing alcohol to your <laughs> neighbors so they don't get corona from I think, it. I Put think we left on it on their phone. doorstep and like rang the doorbell with a stick and then ran away. <laughs> but jamie that's a, it's a great example though you know of, of the right kind good. of question and chris i want to turn it to you because you shared with us earlier what you as the mccluskey household did this past weekend and, and it's a question i think is useful to pose to anyone especially someone who would consider themselves an entrepreneurial family man and that is what level of leadership does your family require of you right now what did you guys do this weekend can you kind of walk us through that you bet. And, and I, I'm always quick to remind people that my kids are older than kind of our typical listening audience. So um, keep that in mind. Most of my children now are in their 20s or upper teens. The youngest one is 12. So we got seven kids spread across there um, and my son-in-law an eighth. They actually began leading automatically in ways that they've seen my wife, Rachel, and I model response to, to you know, challenges throughout the years in that I walked into the, to the kitchen on, it was probably Tuesday of last week, and the big marker board, our portable marker board that we use, uh, was out in the kitchen, and anytime we're planning a big party, a, a haying uh, party or the Christmas party or something like that, why the marker board comes out and they start listing all the things that need to be done, who's going to be in charge of that, and they, they go through and check it off. And all. So, Instead, what was on there was two columns full of really creative ideas of things that they could do that would be fun and things that would be good to advance our home here, the farm. Uh, there's a little trail around the pond we call the gnome trail, like fixing up the gnome trail and doing some spring cleaning in some areas of the house and something with the tree fort and some fun little things that we could do like, like uh, reading stories, sitting on the floor with a kerosene lamp and the kids did that automatically. They were asking, what does this make possible? Because it's like Christmas. We're all together, except there's no presents. We're just together. We're not going anywhere. So that kind of, of call that leadership, if you will, asking what is a healthy way for us to, to process and go through this. Every one of them was already kicked out of the amygdala into the neocortex doing possibilities thinking. So we had a big family powwow the entire weekend. The, the ones that live north of us in town about half an hour, why they came down for the weekend and, and uh, slept in one of the spare rooms. And so all the kids were here. There were 10 of us plus my little grandson. Uh, we were here for the entire weekend. And we had periodic family meetings. And then we had really fun stuff in the kitchen for, for meetings or for, for eating and such. But um, I started the entire thing out with that same marker board and a, and a quote that I put on it to keep us in our neocortex. One of the greatest ways that we can leave our amygdala and go into our higher thinking is story. Anything that, that draws us into a story, we tend to stop worrying about the present and go to a future, hey, what if I was a character in that story? What would I do kind of a thing? So I pulled a quote from The Lord of the Rings and I put it up there. I'll, I'll give it to us here right now because it, it might be fun for any of you to use with your families. It's Frodo talking to Gandalf, and of course, they're facing really bad times. And uh, it starts with this. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. And like I just paused and said, every one of us can relate to that. This is, this is not cool. Wish it wouldn't have happened during my time. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I. 
said Gandalf. So like normalizing, no shame, no challenge. Like, hey, man, come on, it's time to man up. You know, you know just so do I, said Gandalf. And so do all who live to see such times. Mm. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. So mm. there's a great question. What can wow. I do with this time? I can't decide that I'm here, but I can sure use the brain God gave me to decide what to do. And boy, we spent hours and hours as a family doing all kinds of exploration of that. That is so beautiful. And that's a powerful, powerful scene in the movie and a powerful question, right? To ask of ourselves now and, and to, to lead with as, as men, because you're right. I mean, the, the example of leadership that you gave to and with your more adult children, I think there's still possibilities that we can, those of us that have younger children, invite them into a conversation. You know, I was sharing with you guys yesterday, I had to drive, but I had about an hour and a half drive. And uh, my oldest son, Jesse, was 11. Uh, he came with me and, and we just kind of had some some fun, you know, talking and joking and whatever. And, and then there was just some times where I could intersperse a couple of questions like, Hey man, how are, how are you feeling? Like, what are you thinking about these days with everything going on? And I think there's some age appropriate questions we can ask and invite our kids into because they know that right now there's a new reality for their household. Like mommy and daddy are always here. Why is that? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I can't go on play dates anymore. I can't do this, that, or the other. So why is that? And, and to just ask them, questions to invite their little minds to explore with us in a safe place is so helpful yep. you know healthy ways to process fear with kids like what are some examples that that we could give to that i mean jamie michael what are what are you guys doing with your own kids and families i like what you're saying with jesse and we're trying to do the same thing just to normalize what's going on instead of um because i mean one response is that we're just not going to watch the news and pay attention to anything but I mean, think just to involve the children and everything that's going on and just open it up and talk about it and address some of the fear with that possibility thinking. Better questions, right? Yeah, that's good. My three-year-old and two-year-old are just thinking about what their next snack is going to be <laughs> right. and um, <laughs> having their question answered immediately because it's uh, the end of the world if it's not answered immediately. But my five-year-old, he is, he's asking, he's asking questions and wants to understand. And we want to be honest with him and real with him too. And not out of fear, shelter him from what's going on because we want him to look back when he's an adult or when he's a young man and think, I remember that. I remember when we were going through that and we were all sitting together in the living room, telling stories and spending time together. I remember hearing about the president speak about the coronavirus and how that affects everybody. And I remember that I didn't have to, or I couldn't go to school because it could have spread between me and my friends. Like I want him to be aware of what was going on during that time. So that can be, a, that, this is a piece of his life and a piece of his story. So uh, we try to be open with him as much as possible and not give in to fear as we explain it too. Yeah, that's another that's, piece of it too, though. It's, it's our perspective, right? It's not the perspective of the media that continues to play off of the fear and the desperation and the breaking news, <sighs> like the next story and the next story and the next story come out talking about how this is the end of the world and how awful it is. So we want to filter the information that he has too. And we want his knowledge of what's going on to come through us. Yeah, no, that's good. You know, uh, kind of in between your two families where my kids are and, and we homeschool, right? So Alicia, she took the opportunity end of last week to have each of the kids uh, write a little essay. And so, you know, one, the seven, eight year old, they're doing like a paragraph or two, uh, but an essay about coronavirus and how it's, uh, how, how there are new things happening and maybe in our family. Uh, Jesse, of course, did a little bit longer one, but, you know, getting their perspective to, to just say, like, wow, this is, this is life changing. Interestingly, the seven and nine year old are doing history together and they have been for last, you know, well, semester, but the last two weeks, they've been studying the Great Depression. So they have this interesting context of like, wow, this is kind of feels similar, right? Uh, and it was interesting, you know, last, uh, 
I think it was last Friday, I got this, this special invitation through a business group I'm with to jump on this, this private phone call with, uh, with the White House and a bunch of small business people. And I actually brought the kids in for the first five minutes of that call because I'm like, you guys want to hear the president of the United States on the phone? And they were like, what? You know, so they're just like, they're realizing they're living in this historic yes. time. And mm-hmm. so, Michael, to your point, how can we lead and filter and reframe a lot of what they might be hearing or what's out there in the media. And I think we just have to take that bull by the horns and, and take the initiative to make sure that we're leading that family correctly. Yeah, okay, that's good. I know we, we were joking around earlier about some of the playlists that Amazon Prime and Netflix are sending up, you know, Outbreak and all this stuff. But the Slingerlands, we actually, um, it was two weeks ago, right? Maybe a week and a half ago before kind of everything went a little bit crazy um, before schools were canceled. But we watched that episode from Little House in the Prairie where the smallpox came to um, came in. And we just, it just opened up a really productive conversation about, about like, what's our role when, when our country or our community is going through a crisis. And so um, instead of us being all fearful, we just asked some better questions. And it was cool because I know McGreevy, like your youngest kids don't quite understand that. Um, my youngest, Giovanni, he's eight years old and similar to Gunner, I like they're old enough to have age appropriate conversations. And I like that we're taking a balanced approach as much as we know how to just talk about what's actually going on without ignoring it, but just ask ourselves better questions and listen to our kids' hearts and just at least acknowledging it and knowing how they feel and um, just become aware. Little House in the Prairie is a resource. A lot of good values and community coming together. I'd recommend that. Neymar, have you guys watched it at all with your kids? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we love Little House. They do. Yeah, man. Paul Ingalls had it going, right? (laughs) He had some great (laughs) hair, too, didn't he? (laughs) Hey, hey, come on. (laughs) Like a lion's mane. (laughs) Like me and Neymar, right? Hey, I'm going to piggyback on that. You saw me get up there a minute ago. I went over and grabbed a copy of the book that my daughter has that's coming out this fall. It's not on the market yet, but people can get it. And I'm going to read a little quote from it because one of the other things that we can do to help our kids process is that we're looking to evoke from them the things that questions evoke. In other words, to get them to share, like you were just saying, Jamie, to get them to talk rather than what we often tend to do when we're parents and we're very well-intentioned wanting to kind of calm fears is we tell. We, we shush. We seek to calm, kind of almost like tamping down. And then all the things that they may be fearing or thinking or worrying about, many of which might be like ludicrous, like, like, like maybe it's not even reality, you know, but we won't know because we didn't draw it out from them. We just tried to allay their fears and instead we stuffed it and they're obsessing over some you know, monster under the bed kind of a, of a, of a thought. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little quote here. There's the book. The Winter yes. Elf. And uh, just recognize, now this, this came from a kid who's been raised with this kind of mentality. She's got a little character here who's a little girl. Her name is Clara. Clara is talking to an elf. So think here, not of a little tiny elf on the shelf, annoying elf, but like a, a Tolkien type elf, okay? It's a, it's a proper English elf. And I'll try to put the British accent in here. But follow what the elf's advice is here for kids because kids can get this and it becomes like a game to share, to talk. So I'm picking up where it says, the two fell silent as Clara Rose's face scrunched in deep thought. How come I have to have everything the hardest? The girl pressed slowly. It isn't fair. Now her mother is very, very sick, perhaps dying in here. So I mean, her, her, her lament is genuine. Sydney, who is the elf here, Sydney gave her the best smile he could muster. I know it doesn't seem fair, but it's happening, and sometimes all we can do is decide who it will make us. Sydney sat back, wondering at the little soul in admiration. You're not just anyone, Clara Rose. You're going to grow a great deal through this. Painful pasts can make for the strongest futures if we let them. Remember, shaye, shayu, shayish. What? <laughs> Interjected Clara Rose, a sudden puzzled look crossing her face at the gibberish. Sorry, it's an ancient saying the elves taught the humans ages ago, but the humans seem to have forgotten the words. In your language, it basically means share your heart. 
share your hurt, share your hope. I sometimes slip up and say it in Elvish. Shaye, shayu, shayish. These are the things that help us grow. Just a little bit more here. Though the humans forgot the saying, I think it's why they whisper shh, shh, shh when comforting each other. <laughs> They're not trying to shush. They are reminding them. Kids get that. They get a little phrase like that in their mind. Shay, shay, you, shay, yish. They start like rehearsing something like that. What does it mean? It means share your, your heart, share your hurt, share your hope. Talk out loud. We parents tend to go shh, 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 shushing things and trying to tamp everything down. No, share. Talk openly. <coughs> Let me know what you're thinking. What are your friends saying? What have you seen on the news? What are you thinking about? What do you think God would say to us? What do you think mommy and daddy need to do? Get them engaged by sharing instead of just trying to give some kind of an external reassurance. That's beautiful. I, I love how you mentioned there too, like what, what will it make us? Like what will it make me, this, this hurt or this, this pain, this situation, right, that we're going through? Because uh, I think kids can grasp that. They can understand like, okay, there's something, something different is going on here. Something, something feels different right now. But and it could how can us. I, yeah, yeah, but how can I how how could I come through this? How how can I be resilient through this adversity, right? And, and I, I think that actually leads us to this last question I want to camp out on here for a few minutes is you know, we've talked a lot about the family and leading our, our spouse and our family well, but from a business perspective, similarly, instead of you know really asking not like will I survive, but how will I thrive? How will this situation, to your point, to your story, how will this make me better? How will this make maybe my business stronger, maybe my family more resilient together, closer? Um, what are you guys doing? How are you, how are you approaching that? Because I think last week, especially, people were like in this like survival mode. And a lot of people still are. But this like survival mindset. How can we approach that from a different angle to say, how, how can we thrive through this? You know, one of the most important things a business owner can do is to build trust with people, especially current, past, and future clients. And what better time to build trust than in a time of challenge, of adversity? And so while everyone else is looking around in fear and wondering what's going to happen to them, can you be that voice? Can you be a leader that brings hope, encouragement, solutions, a listening ear, whatever that might mean. I've tried to ask myself that, how can I be a resource and a help to people during this time? And there's no better time to build trust than right now. And if you have a list of clients or people that you're working with, I would just start calling them and asking how they're doing, asking, asking how you can be a support to them. And that's what the world needs right now is people who can step into the void and be an encouraging voice, someone to lean on, someone to offer hope, someone to offer sometimes very practical help as well. So that's what, how I'm looking at. I'm looking at all my clients and um, all the people I'm connected with and, and asking myself that question. I, I want to be used to be a help to these folks. Yeah, I love that. McGreevy, I think that's a great place to start of just being generous and asking ourselves questions and how we can help other people. I'm asking this question of what does it make possible? And the answer to that question is what skill should I improve or work on? And so I just actually signed up yesterday for a class, um, a coaching class with um, Dr. McCluskey over here. But um, I'm joking, but um, I did sign up for a class because <laughs> this is not a time for us just to honker down and do nothing. Like we have some margin. And so maybe for somebody it's to, you know, break their art out, art out and, um, you know, start painting or, or writing poetry <laughs> or whatever talent that you have that you've been putting off. This is just a great time to um, learn a new skill and improve yourself. So if we ask ourselves a better question, then we can figure out maybe something very productive that we can, that we can do. Yeah. Absolutely. There, there's so many things that can, can be responded to when the question is so open and it is, what does this make possible or how can we grow through this thing? 
I think one of the uh, twists that we made here over the weekend with the kids on that question, how do we not just survive but thrive, we switched the question up a little bit because we came to a certain point where we recognized, you know, thriving may be a little bit overly ambitious right now. I'm not sure that a whole lot of businesses are going to come out of this in the next few months, uh, perhaps several months, thriving, but surviving, sure. And what could we do to not only survive but grow stronger? Yeah. Not necessarily thriving yet, but grow stronger so that when it is time, when you could begin to pursue thriving, in, you're actually in a better position. Your team works better. Your communications are more effective. Some transitions maybe that you need to do, some more policies that you need to get in place, that kind of stuff, the upgrading of a website or the improvement of your look and your branding or any number of things that you could do to not only survive, but become out stronger. That's a great question to lean into. Yeah, I like that. How can we come out stronger? Because I'm with you. Yeah, those are, uh, who knows, right? The timeline. But so what about you? You know, when it comes to this situation that we face, uh, adversities that we are going to go through, well, first, let's get out of our amygdala like we explored at the front end of this. Understanding that there is process that are literally our bodies go through when we face this adversity understanding that at the front end and getting through that to be more creative, to approach things in a different way, uh, which would lead us to that first question to ask yourself is what does this make possible? What does it make possible for you as a leader of your family, of your, your spouse? What's it going to make possible for your family unit? And then secondly, what kind of leadership does your family need from you personally? And then finally, and I'll, I'll add Chris's twist to that, but instead of asking what or how, if I will survive, asking how can we be stronger through this? Michael, we were introduced to a, an amazing quote recently by C.S. Lewis. I want to have you end with that because it's so appropriate uh, given the situation we're all in. Yeah, back in 1948, Europe was highly concerned that an atomic bomb could be dropped on them at any moment. And C.S. Lewis at the time was a, a real light during that period where there was so much fear and uncertainty about what could happen. And I want to pull something that he, from something that he wrote back in 48. Do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. And the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we were all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let the bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible, and human things, praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. <laughs> 